this idea that you should have higher self-esteem or that you should be happy. It's like, Jesus, it's so weak. It's so pathetic. It's like, first of all, forget it. Because you're not who you should be and you don't deserve your self-esteem. And second, what good is happiness going to do you when you're unhappy? And you will be. So, there's nothing in that to, to get you out of bed in the morning. You need an adventure. And the greater, the better. And so it's like it's back to the high seas, gentlemen. You know, out on the rolling waves where, where there are new continents to conquer and new things to overcome. And if you think that all the frontiers are gone, then you're not looking. Because there's frontiers everywhere and that's where you should be. Right? Working diligently to expand the domain of habitable order into the chaos of potential. And that'll, that'll force you to discover who you are and to bring that into the world. And that's the role of men in the 21st century. And there's nothing about that that's anything but good for anyone. I mean, one of the things that I detest about the current collectivist ideology and the assistance that what we live in is a patriarchal tyranny is that it associates the activity of stalwart men with nothing but tyranny, tyranny and power. And I think that that's dreadful beyond imagining because it conflates bravery and courage and competence and the desire to adopt responsibility and the ability to be generous with nothing but power. And it gives men, especially young men, an excuse to be useless so that they'll be harmless, so that they won't be destructive. And none of that's helpful. It's like you're a dangerous creature and that's a good thing. And you should, you should harness that and discipline it towards some impossible goal, one you can barely lift and see if you can manage to struggle uphill with it. And then things will straighten themselves out. And, and, and then we won't have to ask, well, what's the role of men in the 21st century? There are terrible problems that need to be solved. Solve them. It's within our power to solve them. It's within your power to solve the problems that present themselves to you as your problems. Solve them. That's the right solution. And there's nothing in that that isn't good. So, and there's nothing in it that isn't like that call to adventure that can get you up in the morning when it's a difficult morning. You know, when things have collapsed around you for one reason or another. You need a purpose for moving forward. And it has to be the sort of purpose that justifies the suffering. One of the consequences of, of my illness, whatever it was or is, was time dilation. Like days lasted weeks, it seemed like. Minutes lasted hours. And I mean that literally. Um, and that was terrible. The weight of time. It's the weight of brute mortality. It's the weight of self-consciousness. And you escape that immersed properly. So, and that, that second chapter is a pretty practical chapter. It's like, well, if you're not who you want to be, then think about how you could be better. Take a chance, aim at that, work at it, and see what happens. One of the things I tell young people all the time, I'm not a very typical psychologist in this regard, because psychologists like to pat people on the head and say, you're all right the way you are. I talked to Bishop Barron a while ago. I'm, I'm going to broadcast this. And he said that the Catholic priests were trained in the 1960s to kind of be accepting, you know, humanistically. Mm -hmm. You're okay the way you are, you know. And that's such rubbish. It's like, <laughs> not only are you not okay the way you are, you don't think that anybody else is okay the way they are either. And you're not, you don't think your children are okay the way they are, like you love them and all that, but you don't want them to stay three years old their entire life. You want them to expand and improve and become who they are. And so, instead of telling young people that they're okay the way they are, I tell them that, and it's a terrible <laughs> message for them if they're desperate. You know, so let's say 10% of the people in my audience are young, maybe they're young men just for the sake of argument. And they're like not in good shape. They don't have any goals. They're, they're drinking too much. They're watching pornography all the time. They've got no aim. They've got no structure in their life. And they're just <coughs> bloody miserable. And the misery is twisting them into malevolence because enough misery will absolutely do that to you. 
And then what are you going to do? And come along and say, well, you're, you're okay the way you are? It's like, that's the last thing they want to hear. It's like, get your damn act together. You know, you got things to do and they're going to be difficult. And that, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an echoing Christian message in there, I would say, which is you pick up the weight of your suffering voluntarily and you walk uphill with it. And that not only gives you the meaning that you need in, li- in your life to stop you from degenerating in a dangerous manner, but it actually makes things better. And so that, that, that all has to be part of it. Like, I believe in human ingenuity. I think we can solve all the problems that beset us. But it can't just be, it has to be more than we can enhance material well-being, which is what it tends to be now. It's not enough. And so, and you get brushed off by the apocalyptic types. That's part of what tradition is supposed to teach you by presenting you with examples of great people of the past. The lesson is not supposed to be exactly bow down and worship these people. Mm-hmm. It's be like them, be like them. And you could be. And I mean, that's really the goal of the humanities when it's the humanities. If it's not, if that's the goal, then students will study the humanities. As soon as that ceases to be the goal, then it, it, there's, there's nothing of value there. I mean, great literature tells you, it tells you the great story of good and evil, always. It's good and evil against a background of chaos and order, always. And the evil characters are there to, to, to be bad examples, and the good characters are there to be good examples, or you see the interplay of those forces within a single person. And, 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 and it's a reminder of, of who you could be. And you, you can find out who you should be. It's actually, this, and this is something quite mysterious, I believe. And, and part of the proof, let's say, that we exist in a world of value, your conscience tells you who you should be. Now, that doesn't mean that necessarily that it's infallible, but people wrestle with their conscience. You know, there isn't anyone. I've never met anyone who is, you know, a, a, I'm not, I'm, narcissists accepted yeah, let's say yeah. people are generally tormented by their conscience and the reason for that is that they're not they're deviating from the path that is their destiny i mean and if you don't think that well then what do you think what do you think that conscience is i mean i've asked my classes repeatedly do you have a little voice in your head that tells you when you've done something wrong or you're about to or a feeling and they all they all immediately agree with that no one finds that a foreign concept and so if you don't know who you are your conscience will remind you when you're no, or sorry if you don't know who you could be your conscience will remind you when you deviate and then you can start to attend to that Think, well, look, I'm actually ashamed when I do Mm -hmm. this. I should stop. Unless I want to be ashamed all the time, it looks like I should stop. And then maybe you stop doing that. And and then your conscience objects to something else. And maybe you stop doing that. And as that happens, you start to develop a vision of who you could be. And the chapter indicates it, 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 uh, it looks at symbolic representations it's an examination of a certain symbolic representation of the ideal. And so it's my attempt to um, assess tradition for what it can tell us about what the ideal human being might be like. And the ideal human being is the person who forthrightly upholds the traditions of the culture and forges a way into the unknown. We, we went through that and, um, and pulls new information in and builds, rebuilds himself and the world for you to make contact with the highest of values, you have to bring that down to your particulars and figure out how you do that. It's gonna be a way that no one else does it because you're the only one that's you. And, but you can, you can aim at something, aim at something. And the, the, the point of the chapter is that you aim at something and that will shape you as you move towards it. And then your aim will change, you'll move, but that doesn't matter. It gets you going. And you'll be molded across time more and more into the person you could be. And this happened when I was in graduate school. I had a lot of bad habits. I smoked like a pack of cigarettes a day and I drank a lot. I I came from this little town in northern Alberta. And like many little towns, especially in northern Canada, alcohol overuse is de rigueur. You know, it's it's. And so um, I noticed when I was 
in my early 20s that the only time I really regretted what I had done was when I was drinking. Now, it was also interfering with me writing because I couldn't concentrate well enough if I was hungover, but I also couldn't really concentrate. I couldn't, I couldn't tolerate the emotional strain of what I was writing about when I was hungover. It was too, I couldn't handle being on the edge because I destabilized my nervous system. In any case, I stopped drinking. And the reason for that was, well, I decided I didn't want to be ashamed of what I was doing anymore. It seemed, I thought, well, maybe I could not do things that were shameful and then see what my life was like. So that that was sort of on the negative end, the constraint end. Um, I think people get, on the more positive end, people get deeply involved in what they're doing if they're in the right place in the right time. So that you, I would say you can tell this is the idea of heaven on earth to some degree. When time stops, when you're not aware of the duration of time, when you're so engaged with what you're doing that you're not aware of the duration of time, then, then you've got the forces of chaos balance and order balanced properly. It's, you're not stultified and bored. That's an excess of order. Everything's too predictable. You're not overwhelmed. You're you're dealing with it's like it's like it's you're playing tennis at the peak of your game. That's partly what people experience when they're great athletes when they play. The zone, yeah. You know, and they're always stretching themselves to their limit. You can tell that if you watch a gymnast, for example, who who has a brilliant performance, they've stretched themselves beyond their domain of competence during the performance. And that's what makes everybody leap to their feet. That's that's the incarnation given embodiment right there in front of you for some moments. And everyone cheers that on.